Hi folks, so in this video I'm going to talk to you about um, generating your annotated bibliography entries and granted I've got an entire subfolder on you know how to with regard to that uh, to give you a bunch of different perspectives including um, a video series in working with um, particular particular um, free citation uh, machines that are out there if you so choose to do that. Now if you watched my uh, research video you know that when you're using the um, library databases which is what I'm asking you to do for this project you can have the uh, bibliographic portion of your annotated bibliographies uh, entries emailed to you and that's in essence what I did here I actually had this email to me um, and then I just uh, copied and pasted it, right? Cut and pasted it. And I'm maintaining the format of the uh, entry. As per APA in this case, I've got the hanging indent, uh, meaning that flush with the margin, I have the first line and then each successive line is going to be indented, right? So it's the opposite of say paragraph indention for example right um, and then below that what I have is my annotation now this is a fairly short annotation because this is a fairly short article generally speaking um, the more detailed you can make the annotation and I mean um, in terms of quoting directly from the article and so on and so forth the more detailed that you can make it right the easier your work is as you move along in your projects right because it's less information that you're gonna have to retread it's less of reopening those articles and going back through those articles you're going to have to do for your projects if indeed you've annotated them well in your annotated bibliography um, and you know sort of the key terms, you know you've, you've got your key quotations for example woven into those annotations um, okay but in this the example of this particular article and probably in the example of a lot of what you're gonna find if indeed you chose to or are choosing to look at COVID which a lot of you probably won't I just did because as I said in my last video when I was preparing these documents like you know two weeks ago that was sort of the most pertinent issue in our um, society and on our consciousness, collective consciousness at that time, um, which it is still a pertinent issue. We've got, as of today, 78 deaths in Bear County um, of COVID, and so in the, in the number is going up, um, not as fast as it was, but it is still going up. So it is, uh, it is an issue still, particularly in the state of Texas, but, you know, Probably the the most pertinent issue right now, of course, is the issue of police, police brutality, the issue of um, um, uh, civil disobedience, um, the issue uh, in, in the larger issues of systemic racism, uh, you know, poverty, um, and so on and so forth. Right, all of those issues now are, of course, um, weighing on us considerably uh, and understandably. Right and everything that comes with that PTSD, um, and, and and so forth. Right, um, but at the time, it, it's 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 remarkable what a difference of a week, week and a half can make. Right, um, but in any case, uh, let's take a look at this. So underneath my bibliographic entry, what I have is I have the the annotation. This article provides a snapshot, the rationale of, and the approach to COVID-19 quarantine in India. Though short, the article reads as authoritative and asserts that quarantine is only one in a toolbox of approaches for addressing a pandemic. The article also gives background into past implementations of quarantine. This article may be useful when considering the global response to COVID-19. So this is a fairly short article, but if you you know if you looked this article up because it's also the article that I used for my um, research video that I that I created for you. If you looked at this article, it, it does give some really interesting background information on quarantine, as I mentioned here. So it might be a place to go if you wanted to. Um, 
bolster your report essay, for example, with kind of a historical perspective as a part of your report, you know, you could go to that and, and, and draw from that. Okay, so it, so let's look at what goes into an annotated bibliography entry, okay? Um, begin with the sources complete and correctly formatted bibliographic citation, okay? And, and I showed you that. This is APA that, that I showed you. Again, you could use MLA. Whatever you're using, number one, you want to be consistent with it. Number two, you want it to reflect the audience. Um, to whom you are primarily speaking with your work. Well, who, who, who is the audience for this work? What citation system are they going to be most familiar with? And so on, right? Uh, the annotation should follow immediately underneath the bibliographic citation as the example above. And in fact, in some cases, uh, the, so, some annotated bibli bibliographies will start the annotation immediately after the the um, like on the same line as the, as the last line of the uh, or, or without skipping a line I should say um, I did there because it's a little bit cleaner but um, but 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 a lot of people will just not skip a line and just just uh, give the annotation right um, each entry should include a brief paraphrase of the article's thesis i.e. you know what is this article about what is this article claim right uh, do not cut and paste from the abstract, right? Because if you cut and paste from the abstract, that is plagiarism, and you don't want to do that, okay? Um, particularly if you cut and paste from the abstract and you don't put it in quotations and so, so on, right? You do, In other words, you don't want to pass somebody else's work off as yours. That's not what you want to do, okay? Um, following the um, brief paraphrase of the author, of the article's thesis, uh, a brief discussion of the quality of the article. In other words, how well does it accomplish what it claims to accomplish, right? This is going to be important if you have a couple of articles that tread over the same information, right? Because in your report, for example, you want to use, you actually want to draw from those articles that do what they do the best, right? You're not going to use all 10 of your sources on your report, you probably will use four, right? Four to five, you know, give or take, right? So you want to use what's best, okay? So you need to know in your by way of your annotation um, which is the best, okay? Um, and then a detailed discussion of how that article may be useful to you, okay? And in this regard, you know, this is where I'm saying, you know, if, if there's if there's a quote that jump, jumps out at you from the article or, or more than one quote, you know, weave those into that detailed discussion of how the article may be useful to you. Because when you go and you do your report and your your uh, your um, argument later on and so forth, you could lift those quotes out of your annotated bibliography. In other words, uh, that's that's a possibility. Now, beyond that. What I would also recommend that you do as you know while you're researching, okay, is if you if you and I, I did this throughout my um, career in, as as a as a um, undergraduate and graduate student. Um, undergraduate, I did it on a, a um, in a spiral, right? Um, graduate student, I did it as you all probably do similar um, practices. Uh, you know, in a Microsoft Word document. But if a quote strikes you, right, as potentially valuable, right, I would type that out in a in kind of a running um, research document where I would have the bibliographic information for that particular article and have my quotes from that article, you know, documented correctly and so forth. So that, you know, again, when I'm writing my report or I'm creating my, uh, argument, right, making my argument, I could then pull from that research document, right? That's not the same as the annotated bibliography. The annotated bibliography is more concise, it's more, more organized, and so forth, formatted, but I would have a separate research document that you're not necessarily turning into me, but that you're using to pull information, right? That you're using to pull information. Um, again, making your life easier, right? Making your life easier because you don't want to be stuck just 
not having what you need, not understanding sort of the nuances of your discussion and so forth when you're trying to um, um, draft these documents, when you're trying to create these documents. So, you know, create that running research document for your own edification, right? You can include something like that, for example, in your folio at the end of the term and say, you know, th th this is my ongoing invention. You know, I've used this document, the, the, these, these collecting of quotations, you know, I've used that um, as, I've, as, I've, as I've worked through. And again, you know, cop, you know type out the quotation or, it, or actually you've got the PDF, you know, copy the quotation and paste it in a document. Underneath that, you know, briefly just, 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 just um, indicate to yourself what you think that means, why you think that's important, and just keep that going as you're doing your research, you know. But clearly indicate for yourself which source that came from, so you're not you're not thinking, oh crap, I really want to use this quote. Where did it come from, you know? Or I really want to talk about this. Where did it come from? No, have that set up in in your your ongoing you know document. And I would actually I would recommend doing that for any class that you you know you you have to do you're asked to do any kind of research, you know, um, you want to make things as easy as possible, okay? So, and again, that's the number four here. The more detailed um, or detail-rich you can make your annotated bibliography entries, the easier it is uh, going to be on you, particularly if you pair it with a kind of research log, you know, kind of a, 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 a research document kind of a um, that I just spoke of, right? You can say, oh, that was that article that had this in it. Okay, I copied this quote over here, you know, and so on. Now I can make use of that, okay? Again, make this process as easy as you can on yourself, okay? It, and again, this is going to be a lot of work on the front end. Right. This course is front loaded uh, as far as work is concerned. Research, academic work is actually front loaded because the, 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 the blood, sweat and tears, if you will, come uh, during the research process because you're reading the material, you're making sense of the material, making notes on the material and so on and so forth. Right. You're drawing connections, all that. That's all front work. Um, the drafting of the document, that comes... Um, after you, for the most part, you're you're pretty much established in what you want to say. Now that's gonna that's gonna probably change as you're drafting the document, as it has for me, where you know I'm trying to articulate something, and all of a sudden I get this sort of flash where oh, this is really what I want to say. Okay, so then I have to go back and I have to you know tweak some things and and so forth to say it in this this amazing way that I thought of while I'm in the process of drafting it. That's um, perfectly fine. Washington Post alert. Okay, whatever. Uh, so, again, as I said in my research document, you know, make sure that you're checking scholarly and full text, PDF full text, um, when you're in those databases. Okay. Um, you want 10 sources. The 10 sources uh, should be when on the actual annotated bibliography should be in alphabetical order by author or by whatever the whatever the first element is that you have. If you don't have an author and you have a you have a publisher or whatever uh, or a title that that's the first element that's the order that the, it should be in. Um, again, I, I can't overemphasize this enough, and I, I've said this in in some other videos already. Four to five to even eight hours of time is what it's going to take you to do this annotated bibliography. And that is not an exaggeration. I've had students come to me, you know, after having done the first draft of the annotated bibliography and been like, um, you know, you're absolutely right. That's exact. you know, it did take me five hours to do this, but I'm glad I did it. Because what, what happens as you go through this process is that you become a de facto expert on this subject, right? Um, you will, particularly if you are sticking to the library databases, you will develop 
a, 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 a working sense of what's going on in this topic, and you'll be able to, to write and speak confidently about it, right? Um, okay, and again, I actually mention here um, number eight to create the separate uh, document for notes and so on, right? And I would hold on to that because, like I said a couple minutes ago, you could include that in your your folio as an example of invention. You know that that's that's a great example of invention as far as I'm concerned. Again, I have my email address here. Um, also, I've got on the syllabus my uh, my um, Google number that you can text me um, via that. And you don't have to install Google Voice or anything. You can text that number, right? So. Um, and if you want to meet with me face to face, we can certainly do so via WebEx. Um, we just need to arrange a time. I'm, you know, quarantined pretty much. So, so my my time is your time. Um, you know, with the exception of Sundays, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty much available. So, so there we go. All right. Have a lovely evening, uh, or whenever it is that you're you're watching this. Again, any questions, let me know. Thank you so much.